Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh. Oh. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now's the time. I can actually make Kevin's this sound good. good. <laughs> He's also here briefly. We all right? Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us for our fourth uh, church family meeting. Uh, we will have another church family meeting on July 10th, and I'll tell you more about that a little bit later in today's presentation. Uh, so at this time, let's go ahead and ask the Lord to bless our time together. Uh, Father, we are so grateful and have so many things to be grateful for. You're a wonderful God. Uh, we uh, just want to say that... Um, it's, it's a privilege to serve you in any capacity, but we're so grateful for the blessings you've given this church. As Brian was preaching this morning, we just pray, Lord, that you will help us to continue to be a blessing to our community and that each of us can find ways to be blessings in our neighborhood. We ask that you bless our time together today uh, to help us all to really understand and uh, be aligned with the vision that you have for us and that you'll have uh, us uh, open our hearts and our ears to what you'd have us learn today. Um, mostly that we can just continue to follow in your will. It's in your precious son's name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Brian. He's going to give us sort of an update and a recap of what we've been talking about, and then we'll go through the meeting today. And again, we'll have lots of time at the end for questions, and anything's good to ask about. So it's not just what we talk about today. Anything that you want to ask questions about, you've got us here, so let us answer those questions. Okay, Brian? Yeah. Thanks, Ken. Turn me down just a little bit. I'm kind of hot. Thank you. You sure are. Um, um, as Ken said, it's all, it's, uh, we will leave time uh, at the end and even during if you have questions. You can ask questions about anything we've covered in these meetings, even going back to the first one. Uh, we've moved these meetings from talking mostly about pastoral transition now to talking mostly about church vision for the future. And my job here is just to kind of bring you, um, kind of tell the brief story of how we came to be a multi-site church to begin with. Um, it's funny, I, I realize now that in, in, in FBCG's total church family, there are now more people worshiping here in our church family who have only known us as a dual campus church than remember us as a one campus church, and that's interesting to me. But um, our church is 121 years old. Um, none of us have been here that whole time. Um, <laughs> I, I want to start with uh, the most recent chunk of history, uh, which is about 30 years. In 1986, I came here as, uh, as youth pastor. Um, Bob Gray was actually over at East Campus today, and Bob was here when I came here. We had one campus, one, one building at the East Campus. We had one service and one Sunday school. There were six full and part-time staff in 1986 when I got here. In fact, Carol was, Carol was one of our staff. She's right down here. Um, in, 19, in 1993-94, I made the transition from youth pastor to senior pastor through a whole series of events that we won't, we won't go through, and the church um, uh, began to grow. It had grown a little bit during those years, but it began to grow sort of in earnest. But the whole Fox Valley was growing. If you were here, lived in this area at that time, the Fox Valley was just exploding at that time. Uh, when, when my wife and I came here in 1986, you could have stood on top of the East Campus uh, roof and looked west and south, there was nothing on Randall Road. Nothing, just farms. And now it looks like Naperville. That all happened in this period of time, 19, 1994 to 2000 or so. So church was growing. We went to, from one service to two services, and then we went to three services and two full Sunday schools. And all that was happening. We were adding staff sort of left and right. And we began to look at what we were going to do to create more space. And uh, Dick Brubaker chaired a group that we called the Long Range Planning Committee. We began to study everything we could possibly do at the East Campus to create more space because people were coming. We had three services. People were sitting on the stairways, up in the balcony, and it was really exciting. All that led to us deciding that we could not, uh, we couldn't find a way to grow that space anymore. It's a landlocked area, small piece of property, um, and, and so to make a long story short, we decided we needed to find another piece of property. Uh, after uh, some fits and starts, we eventually located this piece of property, and we purchased it, and the intent was that we would purchase this big, this 20, 22 acres or so, and that we would, uh, we would relocate uh, our entire campus over to this spot eventually, just like they had relocated from Anderson Boulevard in, in Geneva to the South Street location. We were going to do that again out here further west to this location. Uh, and so we were able to raise enough money in that first building campaign to build 
what we call phase one of the West Campus, which is this room you're in right now, a multi-purpose room, um, that was never intended to be an, a, 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 a permanent worship center. This was supposed to be a multi-purpose room that would stay a multi-purpose room, and we built a big sanctuary right out there, uh, seating some 2,000 people. So we built one phase, built the steeple tower, and then uh, uh, we moved in and the church grew again, double digit uh, percentages for a year or, or two. And um, we faced all the challenges and struggles that came with suddenly being in a two campus environment. Everything got harder, uh, staffing got harder, uh, communication got harder, leadership got harder, but we navigated through all that during a period of time. And then in 2008, we hit a significant detour. We were just about at the point where we were going to get out the plans and look at the next phase of this property, which was a big sanctuary right out there, when the economy went south. And Eric Harris is here, and he was one of the first ones that noticed it. Leadership paid attention, and we, we just shut everything down as far as uh, getting into another building program. We needed to trim our budgets. We, just, we survived that time, never had to lay anybody off. We're, we were all as leaders very proud that we never had to lay off any staff, and many churches did. We we're proud of our congregation for even during that time. The giving stayed strong. We ended up being able to, we came out in the black all those, those couple of years where the economy was south. But it changed the way we thought. Uh, we decided at some point in there that um, it was best for us going forward to remain two campuses for the foreseeable future. Um, for, for economic reasons, for ministry reasons, we'd kind of learned how to do it. Uh, to build something else out there was going to be enormously expensive. Um, we didn't want to go into debt. And so we just kind of hunkered down and stayed in two campuses for those years. And then in 2013, I think it was, we, um, we were growing still. We needed to do something else here at the West Campus. Uh, and so we started a, a building, a, 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 a ministry expansion project called Growing to Serve. There were three parts to that, if you remember, if you were here then. Paying off the existing debt from when we built this facility, uh, renovating the East Campus, which the lower level badly needed renovation, and then adding the North addition to this, this campus that gave us more breakout rooms and space for certain kinds of ministries, like our, um, our Masterpiece Ministries that have the specialized rooms over on that side of the building. So we did that. And then last summer, oh, we, we, the timing was right for us to get out those plans again, as we always get them out and re reevaluate, are we doing the right thing? Is this the next step? What's God want for us? And as leaders, executive council, staff, again, looking at growing to serve, what else we wanted to do here, which included uh, the, the uh, south side of this building, a new lobby and all that. And right about that same time, we got out all our plans last year, about this time or so, in the spring, we were contacted by Faith Baptist Mill Creek, uh, about the possibility of, of merging. And uh, as I've t we've told the story multiple times now, but uh, they approached, uh, Bruce found out about it, and they approached us. We went to visit, looked at the site, and we, our first reaction to a person, all four of us on the senior management team was, well, um, interesting, but don't see how it can, we just don't see how it can work. We just don't, just don't see it. So after a few conversations, we basically told them thanks, but no thanks. You can look elsewhere. But about, within about a month or so later, we were on a retreat, and we kind of all admitted to each other we were still thinking about it, that we couldn't stop thinking about that, that opportunity, that maybe we had moved on a little too quickly, maybe there were some things there we hadn't thought through in depth, and so uh, we all kind of agreed we, that we needed, to, we needed help to figure that one out. And that was when we invited uh, Jim Tomerlin uh, to come in and spend a weekend with us and consult with us to help us understand what multi-site is, what opportunities we have, whether we ought to consider it as a church or not. And that, with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, we've, uh, again, we've been telling this story in different formats, and uh, some of you have heard this sort of thing before, but it's good to repeat because I think it gets us kind of talking about our story. Uh, as Brian said, when Jim Tomlin came in, we went out to dinner after uh, his visit to what our Saturday night service before the Sunday when he was going to visit and consult with our staff, and he used the phrase neighborhood church in conversation. And that stuck in my mind and heart, Brian's as well. We used that and began, began, to, began to talk about that. What does that mean? Uh, I would, and I said this last time we met, I, I would differentiate um, the neighborhood church idea as it's beginning to shape, take shape for us from a regional multi-site church. Think Harvest or Willow, where they're, they're just Chicagoland area, Northwest region. They're trying to put satellite campuses with video venues. That's not what neighborhood church means in our mind and hearts. It means a strategic uh, gospel strategy to reach our region. This local area, the Tri-Cities, King County, via neighborhoods. 
Um, so um, we'll talk more about that in a couple minutes. But I, as you know, the church is Faith Baptist of Mill Creek, and they've approached us. They, uh, for their part of their process, was to decide between us and another uh, suitor, as, as it were. They approached us, but another church approached them. Another church like this regional satellite idea I was speaking of. And it took them a while to figure out who would we like it to be. Uh, and they chose us because of proximity, uh, closer DNA fit, um, the- theology, doctrine, and just felt comfortable and safer with us. Even though we were saying, we don't really know, we haven't done this before. <laughs> so um, I-, I-, I think I have the order right, sets in. If I don't, we can jump around. You'll see on the screen here, um, that's an image we used last time. I presume I'm in your way, but I'll move in case I'm not. Anyway, or I am. The, um, you see the dots representing our three campuses there. Uh, Mill Creek there is, is about a 10 to 12 minute drive uh, from our west campus down there in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, then uh, the phrase neighborhood church has, con- has, has taken shape into a vision statement, or at least the beginnings of one, if you will. And I want to talk you through that now because you're going to hear a lot more about it. And before we do this, I want you to understand that this, uh, what's in our minds and hearts and what we're excited about is not about the next building. I mean, there's no reason to do another site if it isn't coming from a, 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 a gospel-driven desire to reach people. So I've said this at every one of our church meetings, but I'll say it again because it's important for you to hear. If we're going to continue to reach, connect, equip, and serve people, if, we're going to, if that's going to produce increased transformed lives and impact locally and globally, what's the end game? Do we really expect more and more people to drive from farther and farther away to a bigger and bigger box here? or at our East Campus? We think the answer to that question is no. The, the next stage will not look like just a bigger and bigger, ever-increasing megachurch here, but a family of neighborhood churches. Here's the vision statement as we'll talk about it. Do you have it, I think? A, f- a family of neighborhood churches committed to transforming lives and impacting the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to talk through that phrase because those words, now that's not on our website. We're not putting that on t-shirts yet, <laughs> but... Um, those words are intentionally chosen. I'm going to talk through what that means. Family. Family is an intentionally chosen word. We're, uh, we, uh, the church is the family of God. And what, part of our niche, although not exclusively, are, is that we're in an area saturated with families. Um, and of all different kinds and ages and stages of life. But predominantly family, parents with children still living at home. Uh, it also talks about we want to be a family of neighborhood churches. Families share the same DNA. We want to reproduce that. Healthy DNA. One of the things Tomberlin said to us is you don't have to be maxed out in your facility to multi-site. You have to be healthy. And on that end, he said, you almost have a spiritual, not only opportunity, but responsibility to reproduce yourself. So families share the same DNA. They share the same history, stories. Brian was talking about just briefly uh, uh, through, through our story. We share that story. That's our story. Even though none of us were here 120 years ago, I don't think. Where's Will Holm? <laughs> Teasing, teasing brother. Will, right? Right? He said that not I know, me. I know. I know. Just he's, the most, he's the youngest and healthiest of all of us. Anyway, it's still our history and our shared story. So families share the same story. We want that to be true about our, our family neighborhood churches. Families share the same uh, direction and leadership and values uh, as well. And so we want to talk, when we talk family of neighborhood churches, we're talking about a shared DNA, distinctives, gospel distinctives and ministry distinctives, shared leadership and direction and vision. Shared history and story. So that's part of what we mean when we say family. Um, Also, uh, same purpose and responsibility. We share uh, the same desire and outcome. Transform lives impacting the world. So that's what we mean when we say family of neighborhood churches. What makes a church multi-site is not whether or not it has a video venue. We'll talk more about those specifics in a few moments. What makes a church multi-site is how centrally governed and led it is. So that's what we're not, this is different than church planting proper in terms of we're going to send a group of people and God bless you. We want to be connected because we're all going the same direction with the same history, the same story, the same purpose and desire. Uh, So then we talk about neighborhood churches. Um, Neighborhoods. You know, it's different than an urban setting where you have actual named neighborhoods that are very clear and outlined in the city. Um, but also different than a rural setting where you don't have those. We do have neighborhoods. They're a little harder to determine sometimes, but people live in little regions and pockets. And our desire would be to, to see the multiplication of churches in neighborhoods to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, you, how many of you drive past neighborhoods to get here? 
show of hands. How many of you drive past a couple of neighborhoods to get here? Right? Nothing wrong with that, but people, you, you probably drive past other churches as well. I mean, eventually, we know that 80% of our worshiping congregation dr- comes within a 15-minute drive of our campuses. What happens then? How are we going to reach those people with the gospel? How are we going to see increasing lives transformed? So we want to see a reproduction in neighborhoods. So the question's been asked at two of our meetings, does this really make sense if it's, since it's so close? And it is relatively close. You see, there's, it's, you could throw a circle over those two dots. However, we think because of the neighborhood that it's in, and you'll see in a few moments that some of the population, the people that we have and the opportunity there, it's the perfect spot to reproduce ourselves. It's close enough, but not, and it, but not so close that it, 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 it's like, you know, like a, a mile away, like another East Campus. We backed into becoming multi-site. And some of you know this as well. Another church uh, approached us in the West Chicago Wheaton area uh, during the same process and said, would you consider taking us over? They're in our denomination. And our response was, we just don't, we're, we're still trying to figure this one out. And first of all, second of all, that seems too far away right now for what we're thinking about in our first step into this, in this neighborhood church idea. So a family of neighborhood churches that are committed to transforming lives. That's Reach, Connect, Equip, and Serve, one part of it. That's the outcome of reaching, connecting, equipping, and serving. Lives transformed with the gospel. That, that means, not only does that mean people coming to Christ, trusting in him for their salvation, but it means the reconciliation of marriages. It means mothers to children, fathers to children. It means families reconciled and transformed. It means every, the gospel transformation applies to every aspect of our lives. It means businesses being saturated with, with men and women who lead, who 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 have the gospel influence how they lead and how they do business. It means impacting our school systems. It means impacting our, our communities. Remember that if you were here, at, well, I shouldn't say if you were here because you preached at every, every campus. If you heard Brian, if you're paying attention this morning, he quoted from the book, uh, <laughs> The Art of Neighboring, right? Every Christian should be a gift to their neighborhood and every church should be a gift to its community or city. And that's, so, so when we talk about transformation, we're not just talking about people trusting in Jesus for salvation. That's at the top of the list but we're talking about transformation all across the spectrum of how the gospel applies to our lives. And then impacting the world. That's really sort of the world at the heart of that, but it's not only that, it's our local and global partners, it's making a difference, it's, um, for example, uh, I heard um, through, the, through, our, um, through Aspen, which is our design build firm, in a different context, meeting about, I think, meeting, I forget, they were re- re- redoing or replaying, um, our last growing to serve meeting with the city. And one of the Aspen um, employees said to us that this, a city official relayed to them how important it was that FBCG stay. They, they, were, they were afraid it meant we were going to leave like the community. How important it was that we stay because of how much they value having us in the community, which was encouragement to me. There should be more of that. Not like yay for us, but we should be a gift to our community. So that's the... the, the uh, the beginnings of a vision statement. We want to see a family of churches that share the same DNA, gospel-centered DNA, gospel teaching, and reaching families uh, that are moving in the same direction, reproducing themselves in neighborhoods for the purpose of transforming lives and impacting the world. Uh, we can, uh, we'll, I'm sure there'll be questions about that. I'm, I'm excited to answer those, but we'll move on to the next set of slides, which show you, I think, uh, a map of... of the, the, so this... These population growths come from the Census Bureau. Do I have that right, Doug, is that right? Yeah, from the Census Bureau. So the red areas are areas that are declining, or projected to decline, excuse me, in population. The green areas are the areas that are projected to grow in population in the near future. Now look at those, those, those uh, wait a minute, where are we? I got my, oh yeah, that's the, on the right is not the, that's just, that's just the key. So you see the three stars. I was like, that doesn't look right. <laughs> You see the three stars represent the three campuses. Look, look where Faith Baptist is. That little pocket right there is, is, has more to do with, I uh, think, the, the saturation of the, of the homes that are already there. That's right in the center of an area projected to grow. Now the next slide will show you um, some of our own homes. The green star, is my giant head in your way? I feel like it is. Move down. The green star is Faith Baptist. You see right around it, uh, the, the, oh, these, these red balloons or dots, pins, represent FBCG families that are in our database. So some may be more committed and more, and, and more involved than others, but you get the sense. Those are our FBCG families. Um, a high concentration right there in Mill Creek, which is right to the north of that green star, because the Faith Baptist location is on the south edge of Mill Creek. The next slide shows you um, how we think about it. So 
If you draw a circle around that, that's the next circle out, right? If you draw a circle around our West Campus, Faith Baptist as a location would be inside of it, but on the edge of it. We draw a circle around that one, that's extending our reach, not only to where we already have a high concentration of families, but to where the Census Bureau is saying is going to be the highest pockets of future growth. So just for those of you that are thinking about, what, does this just make sense? Is this the right way to do this? Is, does the location make sense? We think it is um, highly strategic, actually. And God may have brought it to us for that reason. In fact, talking with the board members from that church uh, through our feasibility phase, which Doug will talk, or Ken will talk about in a few moments, one of the things they had said, you know, that their heart when they moved there was to reach those neighborhoods, Mill Creek, Deer Path, Tanglewood, and, and, and those neighborhoods. And they haven't been able to do so. They're just stuck in resources and their older congregation, it's been difficult for them. But that's their heart, their desire. One of the things that most excites them is that they, we share that desire, that gospel uh, purpose. They, they want to become a part of a family of neighborhood churches committed to reaching those communities. Um, so anyway, I, w- I wanted to give you more specifics about that vision. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll come back to talking uh, specifically uh, through your questions about how that might look. And I know we're going to end up getting specific in terms of uh, finances and, and uh, programming and how we're going to do this. We want to be clear with you. We don't have all that worked out just yet. We're in the process of that. But I think it's most important that you get a taste of the vision for why we're doing this. Because if you understand why we're thinking about doing this, why we desire to do it, then it makes those how are we going to get this done or what's it going to cost or how are this going to work, makes those questions, they fit right. But if you start with all those questions and don't have the why, it doesn't it can take you off track in a hurry. I'm going to turn it over to Ken now to give you an update on where we are in the process to date, and then we'll have lots of time for exciting questions. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jeff. All right, so um, if you recall from a couple of meetings back, we talked about pursuing this in three basic phases. The first one was, is it possible? The second one, is it feasible? And the third one, is it desirable? Uh, So the possible was really those first conversations we had between us and Faith Baptist, talking about what what are we really looking at here? Is this something you want to do? Is this something we want to do? And as you've heard several times from both Brian and Jeff, we moved through that process both as as a discovery for ourselves and as well as looking at the basics of is it really possible? And came to the conclusion it was. Over the last month, we've been going through the feasibility stage. Now, the feasibility stage is where you do a lot of legwork around understanding everything from the legal aspects of doing this, our bylaws between the churches, the legal ramifications in terms of land and, and merger and, and all the things for those of you in the business world understand that you have to go through when you're merging any two entities. There's a lot of legal aspects. We also wanted to make sure that we were aligned in terms of our philosophy, in terms of our faith, and and how we even perceive and view the Bible. All of those different detailed aspects in terms of, hey, are we two compatible entities? Uh, Jeff just talked to you about their desires, why they moved out there in the first place, which was to reach neighborhoods. That was a stated intention of of theirs when they moved out there. Uh, To be honest with you, this is one of the things I think that's driving them in terms of, hey, this is really good because this is the way they can actually achieve that goal because they weren't going to be able to do it on their own. Uh, Talking about a lot of things in terms of detail and and staffing and um, getting into the questions of timing around when would they have their last service and when would we welcome welcome them into our service and what would be the process of opening new the, the new campus how could they become involved how could they get involved in our ministries leadership aspects tons and tons of different questions along those lines uh, there's really 25 that we went through that uh, through the guidance of Jim Tomberlin are really the ones you've got to get resolved and uh, through that we believe that we've actually resolved all of those 25 issues. Now, there's still some things that we have to do on the legal side to make sure, I mean, we have to meet with the city, we have to meet with other parties to make sure all that can be done properly. But I think we're at a point where, from a feasibility standpoint, we've really worked through all of the issues. Uh, Now what we're moving into is making sure that we understand what this means for us in terms of the financial obligations, some of the timing that we need to confirm with you. And in this last phase, which we will get to, is really the desirable phase. And that is asking you, the membership, do you desire to do this? Do you vote for us to move forward with this merger and acquire this, the entity um, and basically deal with all the financial ramifications of that and the legal ramifications, okay? So that's what will be happening next. Um, That's July 25th. 
uh, is the next church family meeting, and this is one we really believe it's important for you to attend. Uh, it's also important for you to tell others that are members, please come to this meeting, because that is the meeting where we will outline what this really means in terms of a motion or a vote of the congregation. So that'll really stipulate the legal things that we have to say and you have to approve in terms of, of the uh, membership, and it'll also outline the financial obligations that we will incur along with this. So that is going to be, the that will be what we'll tell you what all that is, is on the 25th. We won't vote on it until our annual church meeting on August 21st. So the, the July 10th meeting is really about just giving you all that detail. What we really want to do is, is use that meeting for you to ask a lot of questions. Really get down to those detailed questions because um, by the 21st of August, we're hoping that we've had enough communications back and forth that we can just really work through those final issues and then take an official vote of the membership. Does that make sense? So that's where we are in the process. At this point, let's open it up for oh. questions. Oh, wait, sorry, Jeff. More? Let's do that. Okay. But before we do that, I, I have asked a couple people to share, if that's oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. okay. So, uh, you know, it's been Brian and me and, and Ken speaking to you each time we meet. And some of you have, I've talked with, or you've talked with me out, offline or via email um, between these meetings about how this, this idea, this vision is resonating with you. And so a couple of you have asked to share just how the neighborhood church idea or concept or vision uh, hits you. And so um, who's got some mics to pass around? Do we have one? So okay, Dave, Dave, Amy, come on down. You could be the next contestant on the neighborhood church is right. <laughs> Sorry. That was unprepared remarks. And following Dave, uh, you can pass it to Angie. Thanks. Sure. And up here so you can see me. I'm a little vertically challenged, so <laughs> that's what I like to call being short. Uh, but Jeff asked if I could share a little bit about, I, I, I've had the pr privilege to live in the Mill Creek community for the past 10 years. So my family, my little ones have grown up there. They go to school there. There's tons of parks. So I've just had the opportunity to um, love my neighbors where I live. Um, so this, um, kind of like Jeff and Brian said, this is um, a neat opportunity and, and really one that I see as a responsibility uh, with the resources we have to serve the people where we live. It's been really fun for me to be able to invite dads that I've met at the park to team or other families to come to the events that we have here at First Baptist. So um, from my standpoint, it's, it's just been kind of exciting to see this um, neighborhood church vision and how it's starting to develop and, and play out. But the one thing that probably is the most important thing I could probably really say to you today or encourage you today is if you haven't been to the Mill Creek community, which is just right down the way here, or if you haven't been to the site, I've been taking my kids the last I'm going to get choked up here. Um, the last couple weeks to walk around the actual site and pray for it and pray to discern, um, is this what FBCG should do? Is this the community that we're called to reach? And if not, um, that God would place that on our hearts. But if it is, show us how we can love and care for our neighbors here more. And so I would just encourage you too to do the same thing um, because I don't think we can make this decision without prayer, without taking it to God. So I would encourage you, uh, you don't necessarily have to do what I did, like physically walk around it with my kids and pray for it, but drive through the community. You're going to be amazed at how many uh, FBCG um, VBS signs are in our community. I have three just on my block alone. Um, I can't walk to the park without running in to somebody from First Baptist, which is kind of really exciting. It gets back to that idea of family. So not only do I have this huge family here um, in this building, but even in my neighborhood, um, it's exciting that I could go to the park and run into another family member of FBCG. So to me, that's exciting. So again, um, I would just encourage you to pray on that site um, and ask God to give you discernment as to how we can better, what opportunities we have there and what better ways we can reach our neighbor and love them um, where we are and what opportunities there are going to be um, that are even farther out into that green zone that I didn't even really know existed. So that was exciting for me to see today. So um, thank you for listening to me and I'll pass it on to Angie.
Hi, man. Am I good? Okay. Hi, my name is Angie Bateman, and we've been coming to this church for approximately 10 years. And I was sitting in the back with Dave when the last map went up, and I am the farthest corner out there on the edge of the red and the green, way out in Caneville. So back there, I'm like, hey, there's me. So, um, and Hanulas are actually a little farther than us, but um, when the idea of putting a church at the Mill Creek uh, area for FBCG came up, one of my first thoughts was, how cool that is so much closer to us. Now, I live 13 miles away. It takes me 15 minutes to get here. My son, who's 19, can get here in 13, as long as there's no cops. I know you can't get across Geneva in 13. So um, even though we live west, we don't have as many stoplights. So this church isn't far for us to come to. Sometimes we're here four or five days a week. We came here because it had a more developed youth group for our oldest son. In the 10 years that we've been here, we've adopted a second son, and we found that there's other families who have adopted children, which was a great connection for us. We then adopted our third child who has special needs, and um, there's a masterpiece ministry here. So the church keeps adding programs for the Bateman family, so we really appreciate that very much. We have invited many people when we left our small church out there. There is not a lot of small churches out in the Caneland area. Um, and there's not new ones coming. We have invited people here, and a lot of times what they have said is it's too big to go from a small church where 60 people worship on a Sunday to come here. It was too loud. It was too big. They checked it out. They liked it very much. And I thought with the acquisition of another church that's a smaller venue, you now have something that's in the middle for those people that would like to come closer out this way, try something new, but is not as big as sitting in a gym at West Campus on a Sunday morning. So I think you have a whole untapped population when you think of what is west of here. And if you don't live west of here, we do seem like we're in Iowa, but we have to drive for everything. So we don't think a lot of it. I have to get in my car and drive three, four times a day to Randall Road. And that's okay, I love where I live. But when you think it's far away, it's not as far as you think. Thanks. This one. Give me, give me. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> all right. So, hey, thank you very much. Um, you know, it's great to hear from people who are experiencing uh, neighborhood ministry. I'm sure there are a lot of different stories like that. Uh, I look forward to hearing some more of those as we move through this journey together and invite you to, you know, send us those stories because that's really what this is all about. Um, two things I want to say though real quick before we jump into the questions we, we use some terms here like acquisition merger etc cetera, etc cetera, and some of those can feel a little too businessy can feel even a little bit cold you know the there's some there's some terms in there that are legal terms that we we will have to use as part of this transaction but this really is the joining of two entities um, with a common goal with a common vision uh, as Jeff has mentioned already you know it is it has been their desire to really move in this direction and they feel like this is the way that they can move through to the to accomplish the vision God had given them uh, as we are doing the same thing uh, we're looking forward to some ways to tie our two histories together you think we have a storied history we're 121 years old they're 182 um, so as you can imagine in a lot of our discussions there has been a lot of talk about how can we um, save part of that history as part of joining together and so we're looking to find ways to do that and it's it's they have a beautiful history and those of you in the Batavia area might remember the building downtown the First Baptist Church of Geneva is just a beautiful complex um, but hmm? what did I just say oh I'm used to it okay First Baptist Church of Batavia we used to live in Batavia um, so we used to walk by that that building a lot it's a very pretty facility um, Anyway, so uh, you're going to hear terms like that, but we, we don't want you to be put off by that. This really is the joining of these two storied uh, entities and, and for a common vision uh, to serve God in our neighborhoods. Okay, so let's open it up for question. What's on your mind? Yes. The question that I have is, uh, as we uh, have now, we've almost got... Two, two churches, this one and the East Campus, joined with a common leadership. Uh, as one of my uh, colleagues from the East Campus and I were in the lobby waiting for Pastor Brian to finish. And then when they did come out, 
the remark was made, I don't know any of these people. It's like we have two entirely different families, two different groups of people. Uh, now, would we, can, would we exacerbate that, that we would have now three, three independent groups, uh, none of which really know one another? And if, uh, if so, uh, how would we handle the leadership issue uh, would we tend to be like the Missouri Senate of the Lutherans, where you've got one common uh, governing body and then all units would have to uh, share that philosophy? Would you have a leadership group which sends, uh, this, that's, sets overall philosophy but leaves it up to individual uh, ministers, local people, to uh, develop their own spiritual approach. Uh, these are the types of things. Now, of course, then, uh, along with this are the issues of the, the property part. That is something which is strictly uh, a dollars and cents. But the thing that I'm looking at is, would, would we develop three uh, three groups under one name, but really three separate units. Tom, you did a beautiful job of putting about 12 questions into one. <laughs> Let me try to answer that. But you're, you're absolutely right. We have two. In fact, I would go so far as to say we don't have two churches. We have one church, but we have five or six different congregations within that church. Right in the East Campus, if you and your friend were to walk down the hall into the worship cafe, you wouldn't know anybody in there, my guess is. Uh, people that come to the, predominantly to the 915 hour here don't know that many people that come to the 1045 hour here. We left years ago in the rearview mirror, the day when we could be one service, one church, and know everybody. That ship has sailed, and I think it's a good thing. There is some grieving to that. There's some loss to that. There's some pining for the way it used to be. And there's a desire to know everybody. But that hasn't been true at FBCG for many, many years. So we would not become three congregations. We're, we're already more than three. We're only do, multiplying what we already are doing sort of unintentionally. Now doing it intentionally for the sake of gospel multiplication and reaching people. We're already multiple congregations within one church leadership structure. To your second part of your question, which is how are you going to lead all that? How's that going to look down the road? That is one I think we're wrestling and praying our way through right now. Long term. In fact, I think, uh, Kelly, you asked a question either last time or two times ago. Is this going to become a denomination or an association of churches? We know, I think we'll have to hold that loosely as we go. As I said, a family means a shared DNA, a shared history, a shared story, shared leadership and direction for the sake of the gospel. At some point in the future, if, if God blesses this and we're so many congregations, we feel the right thing is to let go of that centralized control and bless them and set them free, perhaps that's what happens. But we're a long ways from that. Right now, I think, reproducing ourselves for the sake of gospel transformation. Yeah, it, it's important to note that initially it will be one leadership group managing yes. All, yes. all facilities, all campuses, etc. This is just a, a quick point of curiosity. Are we the first in the Baptist General Conference to launch this kind of a thing? I'm seeing no. So are, do we have those other churches um, giving you advice or have you been able to, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, great, great question. Great question. Thank you for using the microphone. If you, uh, we, it's, this is being recorded, so we want other people to be able to hear your questions that might watch this. So very good question. Brian could speak more specifically to the denominational churches, but not only in our denomination are we seeking advice, but from other multi-site churches in our region. So have been and continue to seek guidance. Yeah, I, I, Kelly, I was, since we are being recorded, I want to be heard. Um, I, I don't have... Uh, sort of chapter and verse in our denomination, but we do know that uh, the multi-site movement has been active probably about 10 or 15 years in, in, in North America and in, in, in our country, and our denomination has been active in it for all that time. Um, I don't know what the, uh, uh, for example, one of the churches um, that when I first became senior pastor, we went to Wooddale Church, which was a, kind of a lead church in the Midwest in our denomination up in the, the Twin Cities. 
Um, we, went, we took our staff up there and some of our leadership up there to learn a little bit how to, just how to lead a, a, a larger growing church. And at that time, they were uh, stepping out into the church planting movement. This is maybe 20 years ago. <clears throat> and they planted six or eight daughter churches all around the, the, the Twin Cities. And, uh, and then they moved into the, the campusing movement, which was, which was followed right on the heels of the church planting movement. And now some of their daughter churches are multi-site churches. So that's happening, it's happening all over. In fact, the, the, stats, the statistics that Jim Tomlin gave us, not just in our denomination, but in uh, large churches, like something like 65% of churches over 1,000 people in, in, in America, they are multi-site, are moving toward multi-site. And there's lots of reasons for that. But so we are not certainly at the front end of that curve. We're sort of late, late comers to the movement. Um, so we have lots of churches we can ask. And we've already visited uh, we've already visited both Atlanta and Minneapolis to, to visit and sit down with leaders who are doing it and have been doing it to see what we can learn from them. On the plus side, what we can learn them for as far as things not to do. And we're going to make a couple of more visits to places. Uh, and many, they're, they're all willing to help. Everybody's willing to talk and help on this process. So, But I think it's important to, uh, to add to that. There are 5,000 and, and oh, there are over 5,000 multi-site churches in America right now. And that number's growing. That is a huge umbrella of they do it all different ways. So we're talking about a particular kind of multi-site. Again, I want to come back to this. is a, The neighborhood church vision is different than just perhaps what you think of when you think of multi-site, if you think of anything at all. Uh, we're trying to reproduce neighborhood congregations that have the strength of a large church, the feel of a smaller congregation, and the inertia of, like a, of, 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 of gospel's mission to reach their neighbors. That's... You know, I, mean, I said two or three meetings ago, if you ask the average person today, uh, church going or not, if they like, prefer a church of 2,000 or more or 200, most would say, I like 200, that feels better to me, to your point, Angie. However, if you ask them what they want from their church, they start describing the programs of a 2,000 person church. So this is kind of the way of being able to do, have both strengths. Others, yeah. Do we have um, any kind of, of plan, I guess is how I want to put it, as an outreach for this facility here other than what it's currently used for? In other words, will we eventually build more a little further mm -hmm. off here where we use that as meeting rooms and then use this facilities as an outreach within the neighborhoods? in the area so this becomes a, uh, a gathering place for whatever activities may be occurring here. I'm not totally sure I understand the question Larry so forgive me if I got that wrong. Are you talking about this room or this West Campus facility? This room. This room. And, and in other words would, would we is there a plan to use this as a sports outlet uh, outreach within the neighborhood yeah. Uh, and with the other satellite campuses that we use, it, that this facility would become more of a centrally located place where if people wanted to do something in a larger facility like that, they'd do it here. From our, from our neighborhood churches, you mean, or just in the community at large? Both. Both, yeah. Because um, you're going to use it as an outreach. Right. Um, I wish John Harper was here. He's on vacation, a much deserved and earned vacation. He could tell you, and maybe next time we meet, we should show the graphic of facility usage. This facility is uh, currently used all the time by not just our church, uh, but by the community. And yes, I would say that we, we, we want probably the West Campus, which is the largest footprint in, in the newer building, to be a place that our, our neighborhood churches could use for midweek ministries, for large gatherings. Uh, so, but, but to your question about sports, we, and I'll let Brian speak to this, probably I should actually, uh, we actually have a different view uh, and vision for what we might do in this particular room. Yeah, um, like I said before, uh, when we built this, what we called the phase one of the West Campus development. Uh, this room was built as a multi-purpose room on purpose because we, we didn't know how long it would be before we could build a dedicated sanctuary. And then what's happened, we decided to, that it was best for us to stay as a multi-site church. This is our largest single venue for worship. Uh, the largest thing that we do week by week is our worship service in this room. More people are touched here, more people are connected here through this room than any other single venue we have in, in both of our campuses and maybe soon three campuses because of the size of it. 
our women's ministry depends on this room for their outreach team depends on this room all of our large meetings happen in this room so uh, our vision for this room actually is that it will actually be used less and less for sports and more and more for worship and those kinds of uh, meetings and one of our thing one of the things we're looking at is what can we do to this room to make it a more permanent appropriate center for worship rather than a gym now that leaves open the question of whether we, we have plenty of space here plenty of land uh, and whether we'll come back in the future at some point and build a simpler s smaller gymnasium type room for that kind of ministry or whether we use our open land out here for community type sports ministries whether it be soccer fields or or um, uh, there, there are little baseball diamonds for special needs children that you can build and stuff like that. We have plenty of space here. We haven't even scratched the surface of what we could do here. But in the near-term future, this room will probably be used less for sports and more for worship and teaching uh, than it is right now. And actually what's happened over the, over the years, we've, we've had this, this room for over a decade, 12, 12, 12 years now, and it was used even more for sports early as it was less busy. Now there's almost no time in this room to use it for sports because it's always being set up for the next. And Larry next, knows uh, that better than most people. Yeah, yeah <laughs> because, <laughs> because of what you do and you lead. And your personal vision and ministry, um, that would be something that would take place uh, more if we come back and build something else out here. It's not, the, it's not terribly expensive to build a separate freestanding ungrade gymnasium. And we can do it a lot simpler than you can do this room with all the equipment, all the expensive stuff that we can't throw a ball at and stuff. So anyway, it's a complicated answer to say in the near-term future, this room's going to be more dedicated toward worship, but there's lots of ways we can use that space in the future for outreach and sports and that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, it's cheaper, more efficient for us, more financially wise for us to rehab this facility into a dedicated space for worship and other ministry events that would happen in here and make it less like a gym than it is to build a worship center and to keep the gym. We could do that the reverse and it makes more sense. Brand Diamond in this whole thing. Okay, Grant is, uh, if you don't know who Grant is, Grant Diamond was, uh, was on our staff in junior high ministry and uh, left, uh, Bruce, is it four years now? Three? To go and be the pastor, uh, the senior pastor of this church. Um, and so the question is, what's going to happen to him? That's one of the 25 issues Ken alluded to. Um, without, getting, without speaking for Grant or getting too much into the details, that's been a, a front burner issue for us. We would not retain him on our staff, and part of that is because Grant has a, a growing vision to plant a church in a different part of the country. But we would uh, help provide for him and his family. By the way, he has a new baby boy, Rory, uh, their first child, and so we would help provide for his family in the, in the transition time. We wouldn't just cut him loose, but he would not be on our staff or the future staff of that congregation. Um, but we would have an obligation to him and his family for a period of time to help him launch into the next phase. Doug, anything more to add to that or Ken? Okay. My wife and I just came from a church with 12 other comp couples in the same situation in Aurora. Mm. Uh, we all left. Some of them went to faith. And uh, Sin and I came here because her hairdresser came here. <laughs> <laughs> you say that like it's a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> It's well, just weekly. to be clear, not her hair you're referring to. <laughs> it's weekly. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, churches close. And, uh, you know, what would prohibit the people who are there? And the older you are, the more likely it is that when a church closes, you find another church, like we did. Kids usually don't. If a high school kid leaves a church, he usually leaves the church. But <clears throat> what would prohibit them from just coming here? and then using the resources and the money that would have to be spent on the other campus to do what you want to do here. Right, that's a very good question. Um, nothing would prohibit them from coming here. In fact, I think many of them will come here and likely stay and, and at one of these campuses and feel at home. However, I want to go back to what I said earlier. Do we really think that, that, that the best gospel impact for us as a church is that more and more people drive from farther and farther away to a bigger and bigger box here? I would say no. The reason a multi-site in my heart and for us is not because we're stuck, it's not because it's trendy, it's not because other churches are doing it, it's not because we're out of space, it's because we think it's the right strategic decision to continue to expand our impact for the sake of the gospel. That's what's behind it, Pete, so it's a good question, but um, 
I, I think the fact that many of them will come here and plug in and feel at home is a good thing. But I feel like God's brought to us a potential a resource for the sake of gospel expansion that we might not get otherwise, which is also a great thing. So it's not, um, I don't think it's wise for us to say, we're going to put all our eggs in this basket and keep these campuses and just keep growing this thing. In fact, uh, the research is showing that the mega churches with huge boxes on one facility are increasingly hard to fund and fill. Small's the new big. That's not the, the best way for us to think about uh, reaching our community, our, our, our Tri-Cities area. So, so uh, yeah, in, fact, me... in fact, I'd jump in, uh, I'm not a businessman, but if, just from the standpoint of economics, um, it, it's, it's more efficient. It's more efficient for us to, uh, to, to for example, acquire uh, an, another facility that's already been built uh, and to acquire it at a fraction of the cost that we can build a new thing here on this campus even assuming people would drive from further away to come here. Uh, that, that's what drives a lot of the multi-site movement is, is for what you have all these facilities around the country that are closing down and if they can be reasonably renovated and rebirthed, you're saving the kingdom a lot of money actually by doing that. You're not building new construction on a current site or having to buy property. They'll gift it to you many times or you get much more value for what you're actually purchasing in a site that's already there. So there's an economic side to it that's less risky than building a giant thing here. Yeah, so, so it's very, this is a really, really important point. The vision is first. And to be honest with you, if Faith Baptist had become an opportunity in terms of our next campus location, what we would be talking to you about now is our pursuit of a location to have our next campus. And what we'd be talking to you about on August 21st is the authority for funding to go out and either buy a different facility, acquire a different facility, find a different facility, etc. Yeah. So the vision is to have a family of neighborhood churches. Where those neighborhood churches are will be something that will be revealed to us over this journey. But right now we believe that God has given us the opportunity for Faith Baptist to be our first next neighborhood campus. So think of it in that order. Because if it wasn't for First Baptist, I mean, a Faith Baptist, we would be looking for another facility to yeah, that's move important. forward with this vision. Yep. Okay. Um, this is probably more of just a curiosity question, and I don't even know that I feel strongly about the way you answer it, but um, I'm thinking about, and this may be something you haven't figured out yet, um, but I'm thinking about the fact that much of the reason I believe our church has grown and been successful is our preaching from mm. Brian and Jeff both. Mm. And I think that that has been a huge driver in our church um, all of these years, and we've, we've been very fortunate. Um, I'm just curious as to whether you see yourselves going out there and, and preaching out there, or maybe videos, or are you gonna hire someone that's just gonna be part of our team, or I mean? Yeah, what? Maggie, again, Great question. <laughs> it really is. The, the, that's, one of the, that's one of the things that I'm, we, we, I, we are wrestling through right now. Our teaching team has to grow if we're going to grow. So it can't just be the two of us. It already is growing uh, with Pastor Sterling and, and, um, and his gifts. I would not be where I am if, it hadn't, if Brian hadn't had that vision. You know, a lot of guys in my situation would have had to leave to get opportunities. So I, I think God has brought and will continue to bring people on our staff who have those gifts and need opportunities. I get excited about growing that team. Uh, yes, our voices would need to be heard at all three campuses. So it, it's not a situation where it would be all video. Neither is a situation where we're going to put another pastor out there and good luck to him. We would, we would figure out the right way, and we, I don't think we've landed on this yet, but to be connected so that all, all campuses are hearing, you know, periodically all of the, the leadership voices. Uh, so imagine if we had a pastor out there who preaches twice a month live. Once a month, Pastor Brian or I am out there preaching. And then once a month, all of our campuses are hearing from the same person one live somewhere in, on video and others. Something like that. We haven't worked all that out yet. We have to grow our team. But you're exactly right. That's going to be one of the critical issues for us to continue to st reproducing our DNA, as you said. Add to that in it? No, I think that, that and in long term, one of the, one of the things I'll be doing... Um, Which is why it's good he's not leaving. <laughs> one of the things I hope to be doing in my, in my I, I call it my next incarnation, but after our pastoral transition is I'll be devoting part of my job description to developing new leaders. And we see, we, we have a vision to expand our, 
our um, summer internship program, which you saw in the video today. We have 13 wonderful young students that are interns this summer. It's so much fun to see them here, but we're going to expand that into a, a year-round residency program, for a, like a pastoral residency program, that I would work directly with them week in, week out, building sermons, learning to speak, learning to teach. They would gather our DNA. We're doing a little bit of it now. We'll probably have a, a first, our first resident this coming year, which we are not re quite ready to announce yet. Uh, but that's one of the things we'll be doing is continuing developing a pipeline of, of young next generation leaders, whether they be in children's ministry or students or preaching, that we can work with to teach and, and, and mentor into that role. But it's, you know, I appreciate what you, we appreciate what you said. Preaching, preaching is important, and it's not so much that it's me or it's Jeff, but that, but the, but the, but the, but the, but the gospel has to be preached. The Bible has to be taught as God's word. I, it doesn't really, to me, it doesn't matter who does it. It's, it's that they do it. I, I've gotten three messages, in the, probably four now, in the last month by people who are relatively new to church. And they've been specifically, one person even said that they live out of state somewhere and they had just visited. And they said, uh, uh, I don't remember exactly, but it's some, something like um, we, they left the church because the, the Bible is not being taught as God's word. And they, in fact, they had lost hope that it, that it was being taught anywhere. It was really weird, that, that, but they came here to visit, and they, they heard, and they said, we just want to thank you. We're not, we live in a different state. We thank you that your church preaches. So it's, that's what's important, and we teach people, teach young presenters how to do that and how to, how, to, how to understand and how to teach and understand God's Word, to teach it to people so they can hear, understand, and it can connect with them. That's, that's what we want to do. Yeah. So we haven't exactly figured out all the details, like Jeff said, but we figured out so far how to do this with our venues. Like we have... We have uh, six services every weekend right now in four different venues, and we've figured that out so far. We think we'll figure out the next step, too. By the way, let's just make one thing clear. Brian said his next incarnation. He did not say reincarnation. <laughs> and it, it, does it get you excited? He's going to have a new Speaking hip, a Brian. new role, the new and improved Brian. <laughs> Mike, there we go. I appreciate everyone taking a little more time. Ray, if you'd ask your question, and then we'll take one more here, if you would. Uh, as you look at the new campus. So first of all, from a vision standpoint, to expand through neighborhood church is exciting. As you look at the expansion, five years from now, is that a congregation of 200 or 1,000? As we build this out, yeah. you know, is this a collection of 200 member churches, or is this casting a vision where people are sharing their faith, discipling others, yeah. that they grow as big as, as this uh, yeah. Has. You know, I, I know it's a better I, question. I know, Ray, what a good question. I, I know it's very trendy for people to say 20 by 2020 or 2020 vision or 10 campuses by 10 years or whatever. I, I don't think I could, I don't know what God is going to do. If it's 200, 300, 500, 1,000, I think we have to hold our hands open on that and see what the Spirit does. I know it means more. More people coming to know Christ, more people, to your point, Ray, discipling others and reaching their neighbors. So if in five years it's only 200, I think that's not enough. Um, but I don't know what that looks like. It, it, I don't know right now, is it 400 and then we do another campus? I, don't, I, I think we have to, I'm excited to find out where God leads us on that path. In general though, I think in general, I think Jeff and I would probably agree with our leadership team and, and uh, the board is that, or the executive council, is that in general, these uh, sites would feel mm -hmm. like smaller churches but have the resources of a large church. That's what they would feel like. I think they would, they would help people. People could connect faster because they're connecting to a place uh, of worship where they already know people from other places in their lives, schools, neighborhoods. Yeah. So the connection, the fellowship side happens faster. Um, and, and there would be a sort of a critical mass they need to reach for a work, from a worship standpoint, from an energy standpoint. Um, but, but they wouldn't be... We're not looking to, to create more like West campuses all over the place. It's, it would be whatever, because the facility will determine some, determine some of that. The, 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 the neighborhood we're actually trying to reach would determine some of that. But they'll, in general, I think, feel a little smaller, right. but have the resources of an, an So if it's a thousand, it's probably three services of 300 plus, not one service of a thousand. Yeah. yeah. Yes, ma'am. I don't know that I have a question, but I just wanted to make sure that I made the statement of. Uh, just the fact that the West Campus is here and has grown and everything, we've, we already see what's possible in my own faith life. Um, as this campus was being built, um, I often drove past it, and I call them my God nudges. 
God really strongly was, was pay attention over there. You know, what's going on over there? And I, I just had this really big nudge. I wanted to go in there. And my kids got tired of me talking about it. And my oldest son brought me into a service here. And uh, my attraction was the preaching that, uh, number one, the preaching, you were preaching the word. Number two, you meant it. Number three, a number of people uh, came alongside me and gave me the opportunity and to serve, and they walked beside me to do that. That was a growth in my faith. Mm. So I don't know that we really should worry about, I mean, the numbers and everything. I'm not a number cruncher, but God will do it. God will do the work. God will figure out what needs to be done. God will bring the people that need to come. Um, he's done it already. He'll do it again. Thank you, Valerie. I promise Perfect. you, I did not ask Valerie to say that. <laughs> By the way, if you don't know, Valerie Valerie's one of the people that serve behind the scenes around here every week or every, every month uh, and every week at, at, uh, for Word and Table. She's helping set up communion praying over and putting all the community elements together. So thank you for that. And as you would mention your area of service. And I remember that you told me the story about, I love that visual driving by something's happening there. I feel like I should go in there. Um, thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Wonderful way to end today's meeting. Let me remind you again, July 10th, really want you to be there, really need you to be there, really need you to invite others in your neighbor. Uh, those members of the church to make sure that they are really getting the information about the motion we plan to put forward for the vote on August 21st. So thank you again so much for joining us here today. I know we went a little bit over. Thank you for your comments and your questions. Let me ask God uh, and thank God for today and then we'll be on our way. Father, thank you so much uh, for this church and for the vision you've given us for the opportunity to serve you. It is such an incredible blessing to us. And Lord, we just ask that you continue to guide us as, as we look to be a blessing, a gift to our community, a gift to our neighborhoods. We thank you for everyone here today. We look forward uh, to your guidance and your wisdom as we move through this process. Please bless everyone on this beautiful afternoon and just uh, bring us together again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hold on. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I wanted to interject something before Ken, uh, but I didn't want to interrupt him. Um, <laughs> on, on the notion of prayer, and then I'll just dismiss. Sorry about that, Ken. That's thank you. Right. Dave mentioned taking prayer walks in the neighborhood. My son son's D group meets in Mill Creek on the other end of Mill Creek. And so when I drop him off there this year, I've been taking prayer drives, put on a worship song and just driving through Mill Creek and praying. Um, I know we kind of begin to end the meeting with corporate prayer. And last time we, we gathered in pockets, I just want you to know that day is coming when we'll be asking many of you to be taking prayer walks together, praying and fasting together. Uh, we have it. We, we have, we're not dismissing that. And so uh, I would encourage you between the, when we ask corporately, let's, let's pray together between now and then drive out there. In the corner of South Mill Creek Drive and Main Street. Drive out there and just, and, and just speak your own heart to God about that facility and what he might do there for the sake of his kingdom. So anyway, thank you. Yes, and one more thing. I'm sorry to do that. I know this is much easier right after the second service. It's a much smaller group, but we do need to stack the chairs. So if you wouldn't mind giving us a hand there. How many high is it? Nine. 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 If you can. Nine, yeah, as high as you can get them. And No, no nine. No, no. Nine is what we want. Thanks.